I'm Jim Upsitnik. I'm the president of the Preservation Foundation, and we're pleased to welcome you here this evening. I see a number of familiar faces of foundation members, as well as uh, new faces that are here for the presentation this evening. Uh, as many of you know, the Preservation Foundation is committed to helping to maintain the architectural and landscape integrity of Lake Forest that has evolved over the years. We have a precious resource here, and we try to maintain that overall atmosphere of uh, community and beauty and as well as an evolving uh, environment. Uh, one of the things that we sponsor throughout the years is for our members is to see many of these beautiful homes and estates and gardens. And uh, since joining the foundation a few years ago, I've been a resident of Lake Forest now 34 years, and the last few years have been a real revelation. There have been places that we have seen uh, that you just don't see when you're driving by. But being a member of the Preservation Foundation uh, affords the opportunity uh, for an entree into these magnificent homes and estates and gardens that you might not normally have the opportunity to see. So if you are not a member of the Foundation, we would uh, strongly encourage you to become a member and we have included some membership forms uh, at each of your seats and tonight as everyone um, <clears throat> as every show is, would say we have a special discount tonight and it's ten dollars off on the annual uh, membership and so if you would like to sign up we would be more than pleased to have you join as a member um, also you have green cards that are at your seat and if, those are for a raffle that we're going to be having. So if you would like to fill those cards out, uh, we'll be collecting them. We'll kind of pass them to the center and collect them down the middle aisle. And those will be for uh, uh, admission tickets to the Crabtree Farm. As uh, John said, he doesn't really need to go there because he lives there. <laughs> and uh, also for a signed uh, book, the Da Vinci book, so, or Da Vinci book, excuse me. So, uh, Da Vinci, sorry, I'm wrong. <laughs> um, also, uh, kind of like to acknowledge something tonight. This is like a little bit of a side. I know many of you know Art Miller very well. He's not here this evening because he's with his family celebrating his 75th birthday tonight. So, Art's normally at all of these events and uh, an important part of everything, but unfortunately not tonight. Um, the uh, the uh, program tonight will be uh, conducted by Robert Sh uh, Sheroff. Robert is the author of the book, and uh, Bill Zabarin is the photographer, and he's also the audio man, I believe, tonight, at least the, uh, the AV guy. So uh, with that, I would uh, like to introduce Robert, and he will continue with the show. Okay. We're going to talk about an authentic Chicago legend tonight, who actually is here tonight as well. Bill and I began work on this book in 2009 with the idea that it would come out in time for John's 75th birthday in 2012. Okay, John turned 81 last month. Um, <laughs> uh, it took eight years, but, but, but we finally got there. Um, got 20 minutes to take you through 80 years of history. So kind of think of this as a condensed version of the book. We're going to start at the beginning. And the beginning took place on the south side of Chicago. John grew up in this four flat apartment building at 23rd and Well Street in what is now part of Chinatown. But back then it was an Italian enclave. John's parents, Nick and Nicolina, were immigrants from Sicily. They had seven kids. Did I get that right, John? <laughs> I've been missing that. Uh, John was the youngest. He was born in 1937. There were 10 people living in this apartment. John slept on a cot in the dining room with his two youngest siblings. Here's a photo of John and his brother Frankie. His mother and his sister Minnie are in back, and those cute hats and those outfits are from Maxwell Street. There was one college within walking distance of John's house and it was IIT. 
I was a very naive kid, he said. I went to the school that was in my neighborhood. I didn't know anything about architecture. I had never heard of Frank Lloyd Wright. Mies van der Rohe's name meant nothing to me. This was in 1955. Here's a photo of John at his drawing table in Crown Hall. Crown Hall, which was designed by Mies van der Rohe, was brand new then. John's class, the class of 1960, was the first class to occupy the building. At that time, Mies van der Rohe was head of the architecture school. Ludwig Hilbersheimer was teaching urban planning. Walter Paterhans was teaching visual training. But the professor who made the biggest impression on John was Alfred Caldwell. There he is, with John actually in back in the sweater vest. Uh, Caldwell taught architectural history. He was also a landscape architect. He worked for Jens Jensen for several years. He also worked for the Chicago Park District. And he designed the Rookery in Lincoln Park and also Promontory Point down in Hyde Park and he also did the landscaping for IIT. More than anything though, Caldwell was an evangelist for the first Chicago School of Architecture. He introduced John to architects like Louis Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright, and John Wellborn Root, the architects John would become most closely associated with later in life. Caldwell made a religion out of architecture, John said. Every lecture was about the struggles and aspirations of mankind as personified by his architectural heroes. John graduated from IIT in the spring of 1960 and immediately went to work for Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And it was a complete disaster. He lasted barely six months. I was somewhat inept, he says, and I wasn't the best draftsman. During this time, however, he became involved in his first big preservation battle which was the fight to save Adler and Sullivan's Garrick Theater. There it is. The Garrick dated from 1892 and at one time was Chicago's tallest building. It's where the Goodman Theater is today. Here's a photo of Richard Nickel picketing in front of the Garrick. If Alfred Caldwell made a religion out of architecture, Nickel made one out of Louis Sullivan. Nickel was an architectural photographer who graduated from IIT in 1956. John met him in the ruins of a Louis Sullivan house not far from the IIT campus. Nickel was 10 years older than John. He grew up on the west side. Like John, he was the first person in his family to go to college and they became close friends. Sullivan's work, Nickel said, gave him an indescribable feeling of illumination Nichols' life would be devoted to documenting and fighting to save Sullivan's work. The Garrick was eventually demolished and replaced by a parking lot. Before that happened, however, Nichol raised enough money to hire John and his classmate, David Norris, to help salvage ornamentation from the building. This was the true beginning of John's career as a preservationist. I went from working in a fancy firm to wearing overalls, work shoes, and a construction helmet, he said. My parents were appalled. Here's a photo of John and David Norris taking a break at the Garrick. And here is one of John and Richard Nickel hanging out, hanging out on the roof of the Garrick Theater. In 1961, John went to work for a new firm in town called Brenner Danforth Rockwell. The three founders were Dan Brenner, George Danforth, and Deaver Rockwell. All three of them were IIT graduates who had also worked in Mies van der Rohe's offices. John stayed at Brenner Danforth for nine years, and it's where he learned the nuts and bolts of the architecture business. His mentor was Dan Brenner. He's right there. Dan had principles and would take sides in life. It wasn't just about money. I always respected him for that. In 1964, Brenner Danforth was hired to renovate the entrance to Adler and Sullivan's Chicago Stock Exchange building. The building, which was located at 30 North LaSalle Street, dated from 1894 and was considered one of Sullivan's finest buildings. Brenner wanted to make a big statement on the exterior. The way to do that, he thought, was to replace the arch over the main entrance with a metal grill, and he asked John to work on it. And when Richard, Richard Nickel heard about this, he was furious. I don't understand why anything has to be done there, he wrote Dan Brenner. And then he turned his focus on John. 
you don't deserve any exposure to significant American architecture because you don't understand it. And by your very actions, you don't give a damn about it, he wrote. Oh, it's so goddamn hopeless. You don't deserve to polish Sullivan's shoes. And here you are bastardizing his buildings. Well, let me tell you that I am on earth in his behalf, and I have only begun to fight. That was kind of the tone of their relationship. And <laughs> it never really changed. <laughs> In October of 1971, I'm sorry, in 1968, a developer announced plans to demolish the stock exchange and replace it with an office building. By this time, preservation battles were common in Chicago, but nothing had really changed. The battle went on for three years. The developer eventually won. In October of 1971, the Art Institute of Chicago hired John to salvage ornamentation from the stock exchange. But John had a different idea. Rather than just salvage random fragments, he suggested that they focus on one room. That room was the original <coughs> trading room on the second floor. The idea is that he would then recreate the room in a new wing the Institute was planning, and the Art Institute agreed. In its day, the trading room was considered a masterpiece of decorative art. But here's what it looked like in 1971. John put together a team that included Richard Nickel, Robert Furhoff, and Patrick Fitzgerald. Robert Furhoff eventually became a nationally recognized expert on recreating 19th century interiors. Patrick Fitzgerald, who today is head of Fitzgerald Associates, a big architecture firm downtown, was a student in a class in architectural history that John was teaching at Roosevelt University. The salvage job took three months and ended in January of 1972. And through all of this, the building was starting to come down. Even after the Art Institute job ended, Richard Nickel kept returning to the building to salvage additional ornament. And when people asked him what he was doing, he said, I'm sitting with a dying friend. On April 3rd, 1972, he went back to salvage a lintel panel for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Around noon, someone heard what sounded like an explosion from deep inside the building. Nickel never came out. Two days later, John led a search team through the building. We found his camera and a suitcase that he had used to transport ornament, and I knew something tragic had happened, he said. A month later, Nickel's body was found underneath a pile of rubble in the building's basement. Judging from its location, Nickel had been standing in the trading room when a floor collapsed on him. This is the last photo of Nickel, taken by John several weeks before his death on scaffolding around the stock exchange. Nickel was 43 years old. Nickel's influence on John would reverberate down through the years. Like Nickel, John would emerge as a fearless advocate for historic preservation. And also like Nickel, though less tragically, he would pay a price for that advocacy. Developers have always been afraid of me, he says today. But there would also be benefits. John's original work is infused with a deep knowledge and love of architectural history, specifically that of Sullivan and the first Chicago School of Architecture. It's that which separates him from the orthodox modernists of his generation. And that too is due to his relationship with Richard Nickel. John and his professional partner, Larry Kenny, designed Richard's gravestone at Graceland Cemetery. And here is John later at the grave site. Five years later, John unveiled the completed trading room. 90% of this room is recreated. It is the project that put John on the map architecturally. Here is the ceiling. Now only the bottom bay is original. The rest was created by John, recreated by John and Robert Furhoff. The ceiling involved 52 different cuts or colors, all of which had to be laid down sequentially in order for the patterns to work and someone, they did, had to figure out what that sequence was. It's the most ambitious recreation of a Sullivan interior ever attempted. In the 1970s and 80s, John emerged as the city's leading restoration architect. My avocation, he said, is to try to save everything. 
First, because you know you're going to lose a lot of the time. And second, because making value judgments about which buildings should be saved is dangerous. You can always find reasons to tear something down. But if you save things with all of their blemishes and all of their faults, you have a chance of preserving society or the best parts of society in some form. And I think that's what preservation should be about. John's work took on a new level of depth and precision when Tim Samuelson started working for him in 1979. Tim grew up in Rogers Park and from an early age was obsessed with Sullivan and Chicago architecture. He met Richard Nickel in the 1960s when he was still a teenager and became something like a younger brother or a son to Nickel. And of course, he got to know John during that period. In the cosmology of the Chicago preservation community, Richard is the father, Tim is the son, John is the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Today, Tim is the city of Chicago's cultural historian. In the 1980s, however, he worked for John in a jack of all trades capacity. And here's a photo of the two of them, which was taken at a reception uh, after John finished restoring the Carson Peary Scott building downtown. In 1985, John began work on the Monadnock building, which was designed by Burnham and Root in 1991. The Monadnock is famous for its Egyptoid form and complete lack of ornamentation. John calls it the finest 19th century high rise in Chicago. Here's a before photo of the north facade, which has been chopped up and altered over the years. And here is what John took it back to. John also restored the original entrance and vestibule, including this stunning aluminum grill, which was totally missing, and John hand drew it from a photograph. Inside, John recreated the mosaic tile floor and restored many of the building's details, including this magnificent aluminum staircase. In 1987, John began work on the Frank Lloyd Wright home studio complex in Oak Park. The studio dates from 1898, and Wright worked there for 12 years before abandoning his wife and family and moving to Europe with Mama Cheney, the wife of one of his clients. His wife and family, though, needed some income, so Wright's solution was to convert the studio into an apartment that the family lived in, and they then rented out the main house. Here's a before photo of the studio. And here is what John took it to. The highlight of the studio was the two-story drafting room. When Wright renovated the studio, he roofed over the atrium. Here is a photo of John restoring the atrium. And here's a photo of the recreated atrium. The Art Institute of Chicago is John's longest professional association. He did his first work there, an exhibition called The Art of the Sepik River in 1971. Since then, he has done everything from designing the exterior urns, which those were all carved out of solid blocks of stone, restoring the Ryerson and Burnham libraries, and renovating the Impressionist galleries. He has also designed over 50 major exhibitions for the Institute, including blockbuster shows on Monet, Whistler, Degas, and Michelangelo. His most famous exhibit, however, is this one, which was completed in 1987 and is the largest permanent exhibition on the first Chicago School of Architecture in the city. In 1995, John ended 17 years as an independent architect when he agreed to become partners with Philip Hamp. Phil joined the office as an associate in 1980, and they are still partners today. Phil, in many ways, made John's later work possible, and he did this by taking over a lot of the business responsibilities and giving John time to focus on design. Their first big project was the Arts Club of Chicago, which was completed in 1997 and is at the corner of Ontario and St. Clair Streets. The building stands as a tribute to John's last great mentor, the architect Myron Goldsmith. Myron Goldsmith was a designer and a structural engineer who began his career working for Mies and later became a senior designer and structural engineer at Skidmore. He was known as a poet of structure. 
Myron was my hero, John said. I learned from him this whole idea about structure, that everything must be in proportion to what it is. Myron walked this thin line between function and decoration. Everything was about proportion. The Arts Club came at the end of the postmodern era, and it's a very uncompromising statement of traditional modernist values. That's Myron there on the right, actually. <laughs> John on the left, and Alex in the middle. Uh, the original Arts Club was on the ground floor of an office building just off Michigan Avenue. Mies van der Rohe designed the interior back in the 1950s, which included one of his famous floating staircases. John salvaged that staircase and made it the centerpiece of the new building. There it is. He also put it in a glass and travertine box that suggests the original entrance to the old club. Here is the upstairs dining room of the Arts Club. And here is the parlor. Beautiful rooms. In 2001, John designed the Davis House, which is down in Kenwood. It was designed for Allison and Susan Davis. Allison is a developer, and Susan is an architectural historian. John was in his early 60s when he designed this house, and in it you see an architect at the peak of his powers. Many people consider it John's single greatest building. The form and plan is based on two of Mies van der Rohe's early houses in Germany, the Lang and Esther houses. But typically, John added another layer of meaning by adding details and materials like Roman brick and that whole grill that suggests right and the first and the prairie school. Here is the entrance to the house, and here is the living room. I was a true convert to IIT and still am, he said. When I'm designing a building, I think first in terms of modules and organization and then about problems and how to solve them. It's scientific and methodical, not artistic, but I think art comes out of that. John turned 81 this year and shows no signs of stopping. In many ways, he represents an ideal of the architect as good citizen. John has been a consistent voice of reason and integrity throughout challenging times, said Tim Samuelson. You could write a book about the preservation issues John has taken stands on over the years that seemed impossibly radical at the time, but that today are accepted wisdom. Hopefully we've now written that book. I'd like to finish by quoting an old friend of John's, James Kuno. Mr. Kuno was director of the Art Institute in the early 2000s. Today is, he is head of the J. Paul Getty Trust in Los Angeles. When you are putting a book together, publishing a book, the last piece is finding testimonials for the back cover. Um, here is Mr. Kuno's testimonial. This book makes clear that Chicago is as much John City as it ever was Louis Sullivan's, Frank Lloyd Wright's, or Mies van der Rohe's. For John has dedicated his professional life to the study and preservation of their work as much as to the design and construction of his own. And this book shows off both to their full advantage. Anyone who loves Chicago and architecture will love this book. They might even fall in love with John, as so many of us have. We have, and we do. John, ladies and gentlemen, I give you John Vinci. Okay, top left.